Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence in us, for your ongoing work of working within the prisons that we've called home to free us. We thank you for your life, for your breath, and giving us all things. In the praise of the name of your Father in Christ, amen. So that's actually a verse from Acts 17, when Paul's talking to the pagans, pagans, on Mars Hill, because it wasn't going well with the pagans in the church. And uh, he says, the God who gives you, gives you, y'all, life and breath and everything. And it is in that God that you live and move and have your being. He's talking to the the Greeks, right? And he says, just like your own prophets have said, quoting the hymn to Zeus, you are all God's children. And so as, as the offspring of God, why are you creating these things you've made with your hands that you then bow down to? Like, that doesn't make any sense at all. But it's really a kind of a problem passage to my people. <laughs> Because he calls them children of God and acknowledges it. He calls them those who live and move and have their being in God. And he says that God has already given to them life and breath and everything. Pretty amazing. All right. So if we talk about, we'll kind of go do this in three different sections. If we talk about Baal, Marduk, Nanu and Ningal, which were the gods that Abram grew up with. Um, Amazonian gods, Egyptian gods, Mesopotamian gods, British Isle gods. Give me some words that describe what these gods were like. Angry. Angry, for sure. Distant. Hmm? Very ah, yeah. Way away. You, you do all these rituals and songs and stuff to try to get those gods from up there down here. Wait a second. Huh? Had to be appeased. Had to be appeased. There was always a sacrificial system. And the greatest sacrifice was? A child. Firstborn, especially. And one that had not been circumcised. Very interesting. Um, we have, now, she's now 12. And uh, one of our kids and, and his wife adopted her from Uganda. And it took uh, our son and daughter-in-law eight and a half weeks to actually get the child, who was a throwaway child, and, uh, um, out. But while our son, Andrew, who's, who's a mechanical engineer with an MBA, who's a Portland, Oregon police officer. And, um, but in those eight and a half weeks, um, Seven or eight little boys went missing uh, because the witch doctors will take a child as a sacrifice and then use parts of the body to put into corners of new construction in order to ward off evil spirits. And uh, two of the boys showed back up because they were circumcised and therefore not pure enough. And uh, so it's not just Baal and Marduk and... It, that kind of God consciousness is still in the world today. So again, angry, how about territorial? Very territorial. And so if you get outside of the territory, then you're at risk, right? Um, punitive, retributive, bloodthirsty. Uh, I mean, we could come down with a whole lot of list. All right. So let's go from those gods to Jehovah God that is revealed in the Hebrew scriptures. So let's talk about uh, uh, words that we hear in terms of that God. Faithful. Faithful. Consuming, fire. Consuming fire. And not in a nice sense. Like the consuming fire that kills babies and all kinds of things. Okay. What else? Vengeful. Vengeful, yes. Sacrificial. Sacrificial. There's a big sacrifice system that's going on here. 
just in terms of the law, okay? Genocidal, loving kindness, beautiful, retributive, territorial, at least in, even with the, the Jews, they turned this God who was to be a blessing to all nations into a territorial God, okay? Do you see that there is kind of a, mm, uh, trust or not, right? This is, and I don't know if I mentioned this the first hour, but a missionary kid wrote me and said, when I was growing up, I couldn't tell what the real difference between God and Satan was, except with Satan, I always knew where I stood. Pretty insightful, huh? And a lot of us have felt like the same thing, you know? Um, very demanding of perfection, it seemed. And then you had these conflict of verses. You had, go kill all the babies. And then you had 2 Samuel 14, 14. Our lives are like water spilled on the ground that is soaked up, but God does not take away life, always looking for ways that the banished one will be restored. A conflict, in, it seemed, in the view of God. Okay, let's talk about God revealed in Jesus. Oh, I'll tell you about Jesus. What? Forgiving, Forgiving. Gentle. gentle, kind, kind. Loving. loving, healing, healing. Compassionate. compassionate, empathetic, emotional, strong, both a lion and a lamb. Long suffering, loving kindness, loving kindness. law breaker, <laughs> rule breaker for sure. Okay, let's give words, you tell me, words about the God that you really want to exist. Tender, Tender. trustworthy. trustworthy. Understanding, empathetic, empathetic. patient, patient. what is that? Understandable. Understandable, full of praises, full of praises? Grace. Grace. grace, full of grace and cooperative, cooperative. participatory, yeah? Relational, Relational. close, close. Authentic. authentic. Compassionate, inclusive, inclusive. Knowable. knowable, miraculous, miraculous. Divine. divine, human, approachable. approachable. Okay, <laughs> question here. What's the difference between God revealed in Jesus and this last list? So, so at the deepest core of your being, you want the God that looks just like Jesus. Yes. So the problem isn't with the God who is revealed in Jesus. It's our ability to trust that God. And yet it's the God you want. So what are the things that have prevented us from embracing the reality of the God who is revealed in Jesus? Feeling not good enough. Feeling not good enough. Trauma. Trauma. What happened to us? Trauma. Oh, that's just your hair. Okay. Experience. Experience and? Comparison. Comparison. Is that what I heard? Yeah. Fear. There's a big one. How about indoctrination? How about not trusting our ability to hear? How about not trusting, period? <laughs> that can have a lot to do with the ways and experiences that we've grown up. Disappointments. Our disappointments. Our inability to control this God. Shame. Shame. Suffering? Yep. Yeah. 
So you can see all of these things that are stacked up on our side that prevent us from trusting the God who is actually worthy of being trust, his trustworthy and revealed in Jesus. So it's like a paradigm or a pair of glasses, right? You put on a pair of glasses that you're going to look through and, and the encouragement is to put on the pair of glasses named Jesus. So no matter what you're looking at, you're looking through and with the person of Jesus. So tell me about the things that we know, that we know, that we know about the God who is revealed in Jesus, that we know are true. God is good. God is by nature love. God is not sacrificial. Now, that's a big one because our indoctrination says, oh, no, God is all about the sacrifice. No, God hates sacrifice. And, and we didn't know it at first, but it becomes more and more clear through the artists, the musicians, the poets, and then the prophets. And the prophets are right in your face about it. I hate the smell of your uh, offerings and your sacrifices. Right? So one of the first things that Abraham is taught by God is that I don't do child sacrifice. Don't do it, don't do it, right? And he goes through this whole thing in which he invites Abraham to kill his own son. And Abraham's like, okay, because that's what gods do, right? And his son must have gone with it, along with it because he's like 30 years old. We all think he's 12 so that we can have this thing called the age of accountability. But... He's actually like 30 years old because right after that whole scene, it says that this girl was born to his uncle in Paddan Aram. And by the way, she turns out to be um, Isaac's future wife and there's a 30-year 30 age, 30 age difference. Right? So anyway, not sacrificial. So here, we know that God is love. We know that we know that we know. Or else, what hope is there? Then we have this ambivalent thing. We're back to some gods of, you know, Marduk and Baal and all that. So, uh, gods who require... Does the god we know actually need anything? Nope. No. That's also um, in Acts 17. This is not a god who can be served by human hands as if this god needed anything. Which means God doesn't need your praise, doesn't need your worship, doesn't need your money, doesn't need your ministries, doesn't need your attention, doesn't need, doesn't need anything. That should be a relief. This is all about God will never use you. Take that out of your vocabulary. Use is, a, is an abusive term. We would, I would never say to my grandchild, ooh, can't wait till you grow up so I can, you know, you can be a tool I can use. Would never do it. It's a non-relational, unloving, abusive term. Yeah, God, God can utilize situations and all that, but with us, it's always an invitation to participate because it's always relational and it's always love. God doesn't use us, ever. God doesn't need us. Nothing about this is because God has a need. Everything is about an invitation to participate. That's a beautiful thing. So we know that God is love by nature, other-centered, self-giving, self-sacrificial, co-suffering. So that is the truth of God's being. God is kind. In order for God to be whole, holy, God can never act in a way that is not loving. Never. Because God is holy. So the ways of God's being match the truth of God's being. The ways of God's being are an expression of the truth of who God is. And at any point, if there is a disconnect between the nature of God and the actions of God, then God has ceased to be love, ceased to be God, or we don't 
understand the nature and character of God. So when you're dealing with scripture, when you're dealing with theological stuff, always remember the truth of God's being. But what about exactly? That's exactly the point I'm trying to make. But what about... Yes, we can have the what about questions. That's a great thing. But never leave the truth of God's being. Do not deny the truth of God's being by a what about. Because there's ways to look at those what about passages that make some sense that are in alignment. Some of them don't. Some of them don't make sense about the nature and character of God. Abraham did not go to seminary. Which in many cases, that's an advantage. But in his case, he didn't have any idea about God at all. All he heard was a voice. And I like to say, if spirituality is an A to Z scale, Abraham had put a step into B from A. Because, you know, Nanu and Ningal, they were like all the gods and stuff like that. But here's a voice that says, get out of town. And he packs up all of his little gods because it's territorial. So you want, you know, you want those little gods to at least keep you safe. Because you don't know this voice is going to. And, uh, but he, he's got a foot in B and he leaves. And at some point he gets both feet in B. And once he gets both feet in B, he looks at the A people and says, they're such idiots. They haven't had the experience that I've had. Right? C people, they're just crazy people. <laughs> right? To be or not to be, this is reality and spirituality. But you look back where you come from, and a lot of times, you then attack them as if you're now better than them. Right? And so slowly we're moving. And a lot of times it was the revelation of a new name for God's character that was the next step. So when he's up on the, on the mountain and the knife's coming down and God says, stop. It's, let me tell you something that you don't know about me. If you need a sacrifice, Jehovah Jireh is my name. I will provide myself. I myself will provide. I will provide myself. But I know you're so wrapped into this sacrificial system. Here's a goat. But one day there will be a lamb who will take away, who will put an end to sacrifice. Finally. Right? But meanwhile, in your lostness, I'm not going to come into the middle of where you're at and violate everything. Because this is an incremental little process and journey. And I don't, I don't harm anybody. When you look at Jesus, you begin to realize that God has never killed a person. God has never killed a human being. Can you put the gun in Jesus' hands? Can you create the genocide out of his activities? Can you... What do you hear about the revelation of the Father in Christ? Those are where you stand. The what about verses? We'll deal with those verses as the Holy Spirit opens up stuff within the context of the community of faith. All of that. All of those pieces. One of, those, um, one of those big what about God as a judge thing. And um, yeah, let's, you want to do the, the judge thing? Or we can skip past the judge thing. And, okay, okay, okay. So I grew up judge, the God who is a judge was in a courtroom, right? And that's because Luther was a lawyer, Calvin was a lawyer, Augustine was a lawyer. Guess what? We ended up with forensic theology. Legal, inside of a courtroom kind of thing. I don't know if you grew up this way, but God the Father was the judge at the top of the seat, and he was going to, you know, declare the punishment. Um, he'll make the judgment and the punishment. And so you go into the courtroom, and the big thing is, are you guilty according to the law? And if you're guilty according to the law, my people said that the punishment was... Yeah, but what did death look like? Eternal, eternal conscious torment. So anytime we saw eternal punishment, 
we read eternal conscious torment. That's what we did. So, but that's our model. God is a judge in a courtroom. It's a, it's a kind of a, a, a good kind of courtroom because Jesus is our defense attorney if we pay him. Right? You've got to pay him or he's not going to defend you. Right? And so how do you pay him? You pray the sinner's prayer. Now, unfortunately, the sinner's prayer is only like 200 years old. It came out of the revivalist system. So what the hell happened to the people before that? I don't know, you know. But all of a sudden, we've got, you pay the defense attorney, Jesus, who will then go to his dad, who just happens to be the judge, and he will say to his dad, Dad, this guy paid me. So, if it's okay with you, I will take his punishment on myself. Sound familiar? What was the punishment? Eternal conscious torment. Death as eternal conscious torment. So, seems like Jesus lied to his dad. When has Jesus been in eternal conscious torment? Right? And uh, there's a whole lot of problems with eternal conscious torment. Let me just tell you. All kinds. We could spend a whole bunch of time saying, this is a problem. What do you do with babies? What do you do with people who, you know, who are mentally ill? How about the people who've never heard? I was told in seminary or Bible school, the people who have never heard are judged according to the revelation that they've received in the natural creation. And then my answer is, why are we going to tell them about Jesus? Because it's the natural creation. The bar is really low. As soon as we tell them about Jesus, they're in big trouble. Yeah? And so, and I only know two, actually women, both of them, that actually believed in hell. Everybody talks about it, but nobody believes it, uh, except for these two women, because they both killed their children before they reached the age of 12. And their defense in court was, I would rather go to hell forever myself than to take the risk that my children would. Right? That's somebody who actually believes in eternal conscious torment. It's sick. It's all twisted up, but it's twisted up according to the way that we were presented. There's a problem there. In this courtroom, God as judge is subservient to the law. He might even like you, maybe love you, but he's still got to pronounce the judgment and the punishment is, my people, eternal conscious torment. So what was the early church model? Was God a judge? Absolutely. Even though, listen, there are verses in the New Testament that says God doesn't judge anybody. He's put all judgment in the hands of the Son. Then there's another one that's Jesus saying, oh, I don't judge anybody. I came that the world would be saved, right? And so it's like, what is going on here? Well, the early church had a model of God as a judge, but he was a doctor. He was the great physician in a hospital. Does the doctor judge you? Yeah. Do you want to go see the judge? Yes. If you're hurting, if something's wrong, you want to go get it judged. So you go to the doctor and he judges you and then he pronounces the punishment, which could be chemotherapy, which could be uh, put your arm in a cast which could be all manner of things, antibiotics, whatever. You do understand that everything in that model is geared to your healing. Everything. Right? This is why uh, the Hippocratic Oath says, I will do no harm. I'll do no harm. Because the doctor hospital model does not want to do harm. So what is the target of the great physician? What is the fiery fury of the great physician? What is he after destroying? That which is wrong and keeps you from being healthy and fully human and fully alive. The doctor's not there trying to hurt you or punish you. He's after that which is harming you. That's the beauty of a God who is a judge. And there are three basic families of the word, the word judge. 
Um, Crino is one of them, which was used a lot, especially through the Hebrew scriptures when it was translated into Greek. But it, was, it had a legal sense to it, but was overwhelmed by loving kindness as it goes through the Hebrew scriptures. Crino, Croesus, Baxter would tell you that Croesus is our Latinized word for crisis. It means the conflict. Pointed, there's a point at a time for a person to die, and after that, the conflict. And Baxter's phrase is, you will meet Jesus face to face, and you know that he knows that you know that he knows. <laughs> but you enter a conflict, and it talks about ages of judgment, and usually it uses the Colasis family. The Colasis family is the word judgment, but it is overwhelmingly and never violated that it is a word to heal and restore. So let's, let's quickly use one little parable, and that's the one that people always bring up, but what about the sheep and the goats? Matthew 25, yeah? And in that, there's no, like, you didn't say the sinner's prayer, therefore, you know, you go to everlasting punishment. It's like you didn't treat, you didn't actually, the ways of your being did not express the truth of your being, right? So, so the ways of your being were such that you didn't care for anybody. And therefore, you need to go to everlasting kalasis. Now, um, it's always in my pocket. I should know better. So let me just read you a little bit about Colossus so that you have, uh, you have something more than just my word for it. The word for punishment is Colossus. The word was originally a gardening word. Its original meaning was pruning trees. In Greek, there are two main words for punishment, Timoria and Colossus. And there's a great distinction between them. Aristotle, the Greek, defines the difference. Colasis is for the sake of the one who suffers it. Timoria is for the sake of the one who inflicts it. Right? Plato says that no one punishes, Kalesi, a wrongdoer simply because he's done wrong. That would be to take unreasonable vengeance. Timoria. We punish a wrongdoer in order that he may not be wrong again. Clement of Alexandria defines Colossus as pure discipline and Timoria as the return of evil for evil. Aulus Gellius says that Colossus is given that a man may be corrected. Timoria is given with that dignity and authority may be vindicated. The difference, listen, the difference is quite clear in the Greek and it is always observed. Timoria is retributive punishment. Colossus is remedial discipline. Colossus is always given to amend and cure. Always. Timoria, vengeful vengeance, is never used of God. Ever. Kalesis is what is used of God. Timoria is only used for how people treat each other. Vengeful, retributive, and all that. So, in the sheep and the goats, it says, the goats are sent away to everlasting Kalesis. But the word everlasting doesn't mean ever, never-ending time. That was not in the frame of reference for the Greeks or the Hebrew. It meant age enduring. In fact, there, there are, it's in the plural sometimes. Ionios is like, if we said that was everlasting time, you'd go like, there are more than one everlasting times. Oh, that's a problem. But but Ionios is the age enduring or the time that it takes to accomplish its purpose. So what is happening with the goats, they're going away to the time that it takes in order to heal them. Does that make sense? So the, the fiery fury who is God and God's love because he's a consuming fire and frankly fire hurts. It's not painless. But that fiery fury is not aimed at you. It is aimed at what is harming you. So it is love. It's not vengeance according to the law. It's not punitive. Does this make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got to keep track of my time here so that Baxter gets a bunch of it. Okay. 
Next little step, and that's not a little step, it's a huge step. Remember I said wholeness or holiness is when the ways of your being are a proper expression of the truth of your being. What is the truth of you being human? Let me describe what a human being is to begin with. A human being, how many human natures are there? One. You guys are so Western, and I, know, I get it. I don't want to be wrong. See, that's, that's the biggest fear of the Western mind, is being wrong, right? And uh, I don't want to look stupid, right? Because it's all about perfectionism. And, uh, and I'm, I'm a recovering perfectionist. I'm firstborn preacher's kid, missionary kid. And uh, I know that world. So, um, but... A human being is the human nature which we all share in union with the divine nature that is there because of the presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? You do not have a divine nature apart from that union. Let's be really clear about that. The only way that you are in union with the divine is because of the indwelling presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you have the union of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with your human nature and embodied. That's the piece that makes you so different than every other person on the planet. You are embodied. From the moment of conception, you're embodied. There is a whole bunch of DNA and already experiences within the womb that will begin to change your embodied presentation into the universe. Right? There's the color of your skin. It's already there in the DNA. There are epigenetics. Like I said, there's experience that is happening. There is the harm that has been done to that genetic material. And, and it goes on and on and on. And then you are born into a particular culture that you didn't ask to be. You are part of a community of people, and it, and it makes a difference whether you have both parents, whether your dad beats the hell out of you or not, whether he's an alcoholic, whether um, uh, your mom's a, dr a drug addict, or they're hyper-religious, or, I mean, all of this goes into the formation of who you are as an embodied person. That's the person part, is your embodiment. Does this make sense? So, if the truth of your being matching, or the ways of your being matching the truth of your being makes you whole, what is the truth of your being? And Baxter told you this morning. I grew up where the truth of your being is that you have a sin nature, you are totally depraved, and like Calvin, uh, uh, Calvin uh, Luther said, you are snow-covered dung. Post. Piece of shit theology. Right? That's the truth of your being. No, here's a problem. Okay, if wholeness is when the ways of your being match the truth of your being, you are going to be at war with yourself in order to try to be righteous because it's contrary to your nature. To be whole, you better be a piece of shit and act like one. Sack of shit, thank you. That's Baxter helping me out with my language. <laughs> shit, by the way, is a profanity or a vulgarity. It's not a curse. Right? It's not cursing. Cursing would be like, I wish you had never been born. There's a curse. I wish you'd have been a boy. Like a, a, a woman told me, the curse in, in her life was her dad saying, I made you, I can kill you. But we can make a huge list of curses. You're ugly. You will never amount to anything. Well, we'll just have to take care of him. It's one of the curses that Baxter had. He's just dumb. Right? Those are curses. So, if it's true that we have a sin nature, when we talk about nature, we're talking about the truth of who we are, the deepest, deepest, deepest truth. So if that is the truth of who you are, then how in the world are you going to express any kind of right living? 
And sin is now defined as missing the mark of perfect behavior. Right? Hamartia. Missing the mark of perfect behavior. How is that even possible? Well, it's not. Because you're only good as, as, as the last moment of perfect behavior, and it had to be absolutely contrary to your nature, which is sinful, because you're totally depraved. Any of you grow up with the good dog, bad dog? Right? And who are you going to feed today? You're going to feed the good dog, you're going to feed the bad dog. And how do you feed the good dog? You tithe. If the preacher's preaching it. You, you tithe, you pray, you read your Bible. How do you feed the bad dog? In, in my generation, it was you go to a movie, you dance, you swear, you smoke, you drink. I know. And so you've got this war between the two dogs. And my question is, uh, is, the, is the chooser, the one who chooses, is that part of the good dog or the bad dog? Obviously, it's not part of the good dog because it chooses the bad dog quite regularly. <laughs> so, and then you add on an addiction. I had a porn addiction from the time I was 12 years old to almost, well, till I was past 38. Kim didn't know. I was really good at hiding my addictions. I hated myself. I hated the addiction. I hated it, hated it, hated it. I tried to find ways to kill the addiction, like self-discipline, but self-discipline is a work of the flesh. So I'm trying to use evil to kill evil, you know. It's like not going to happen. But it was good dog, bad dog theology. And so I always lost. It was just a matter of time or whatever, right? And it's, it's like, how in the world? Because I'm at war. And at, at some point, you just give up. And yet, you're still drawn back by the beauty of Jesus in some way. And you, and you rededicate. How many of you have rededicated your lives? I bet you I've rededicated my life more than most of you. Because <laughs> I'm like, I'm in the thousands. I'm like, um, yeah, yeah. So it's, and in our, in our theology, you didn't have to go back and start like totally over. You know, you didn't have to now ask Jesus into your life again, although we did it a few times just to make sure. And, uh, but we would, we would start right at basically ground zero and take another run at it, you know. And it usually took like, oh, well, sometimes it took four or five days. Yeah. And then, you know, then you did a serious enough problem where you're, you couldn't be in the perfect will of God, you can only be in the permissive will of God kind of crap we grew up with. But, but again, the whole thing is based on the assumption that I have a sin nature and that's the truth of my being. The word sin, ha, martia, it's got two syllables. Ha is a negation. That means dis or un. That's where they get missing from. Missing the mark, but they, the word itself answers the question. Missing the mark of what? And Baxter told you the answer this morning. Missing the mark of origin. Missing the mark of origin, or the truth of who you are, which is being made in the image and likeness of God. You're created in Christ. Christ is the image and likeness of God. That union is your origin. That's why... The guys I know on death row, if you go down into the deep places of their soul, none of them want to lie. They all want to be a truth teller. They all want to do no harm. They all want to be a good person. Every single one of them, unless they're so mentally destroyed, they can't even put the ideas together. That's what's at the deepest places. Why is that at the deepest places? You would think that if you had a sin nature, at the deepest places would be exactly the opposite. But it's because you're made in the image and likeness of God that the truth of your being is that you are in union and therefore you are good by nature. You are good by nature. 
You are kind by nature. You are patient by nature. You are long-suffering by nature. You are self-controlled by nature. You are pure of heart by nature. Those last two things, when I saw those as the truth of my being, it destroyed my addiction to porn. My life works from the inside out. You know what? Nobody prays for any of those things in the New Testament. Isn't that weird? Nobody. You won't find a prayer for patience. We do it all the time. It's like God has a, has a jar of it or something, you know? And so if you pray, it's like just a spoonful of patience, you know? And it's like, oh, thank God he gave me some patience. Because what? I have a sin nature. I'm not patient by nature. Therefore, God has to give it to me. Or the Holy Spirit has to come and help me be patient, which, by the way, she's done a very bad job in my life because, you know, I drive. It's like back in the, you know, everybody didn't have a chariot back where, you know, in the early church. And so, again, what is going on here? Wholeness, holiness, is when the ways of your being match the truth of your being. Almost, in fact, I'd have to look, but I think every one of Paul's epistles, the first half of them is about the truth of your being. I pray that your inside eyes would be open, that you would see. See, right? That you would have the inside eyes that would see the truth. And then the last half is, so, because you see the truth of who you are, don't do this kind of stuff. It's so contrary to your nature. Where are most of the preaching done from? The half, the second half. So they start with, don't, 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 and you're back to a legalistic system of performance, and you're trying to solve this thing of not missing the mark of behavior. And you will, you will begin to define your identity based on how you perceive your behavior. That's not the truth of who you are. Now, it makes for a good excuse, though. You know? As a person thinks in their heart about the truth of their being, so becomes the ways of their being. And by the way, this helps solve, this truth and ways thing helps solve a lot of scriptural passages. Are they talking about the truth of their being or the ways of their being? When Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan, is he talking about Peter being ontologically Satan? No. He's saying the ways that you're acting right now are the ways of the accuser. When he says to the Pharisees, you are all children of Satan. Are they really? No. Acts 17 says they're all children of God. But they're sure acting like the accuser. Right? So, and if you don't know that, you get stuck. There are a lot of things that are about the ways of our being that we mistake for the truth of our being, and it gives us theological problems. It's talking about our experience. And people bring up the what about verses. A lot of them are stuck on, in that distinction between truth and ways of being. So when you don't know that the truth of your being is that you're made in the image of God, you are by nature love and kindness and patience. When you're acting on the road impatiently, it's because you forgot. Or you didn't even know to begin with the truth of who you are. So when you know that you are by nature, because of your union with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that agape does not keep a record of wrongs, you don't either. The truth of your nature is you don't keep a record of wrongs. That's why forgiveness is so powerful. Because it reinstates the truth of your being. I'm not going to keep a record of wrongs. That's a hard one. You know, it only took me, what, until my dad turned 80 before I finally had completely let him go of the record of wrongs. And really, I had baptized record of wrongs as expectations that he failed to meet. And it wasn't until I realized that that I allowed him to become something greater than my dad. And that was to become a human being. Because human being is a greater reality than being a dad, which is a subset. And once I 
once I let him become human rather than the failure of meeting my expectations, suddenly his story mattered. Suddenly listening to him mattered. And without any expectations, our relationship began to change. And when you learn to live without expectations, everything becomes a gift. And he now suddenly began to give me gifts and give me gifts and give me gifts. And this man who had beat the hell out of me and didn't know how to be a father, two years ago, two months before he died, we had started to have fair, fairly regular phone calls. And I, I started a uh, call and he, sa he, he said, Paul, there's something I need to tell you. And that phrase, there's something I need to tell you, had been a key phrase when he was going to tell me about a tragedy. Paul, there's something I need to tell you. Your sister is pregnant out of wedlock. Paul, there's something I need to tell you. Stephen was killed, 18-year-old, my brother. He was killed. Paul, there's something I need to tell you. Debbie's daughter, that was the daughter that she was pregnant out of wedlock, holding, carrying, had been killed the day after her fifth birthday. There's something I need to tell you. And so inside this conversation, my dad says, Paul, there's something I need to tell you. And I, I kind of have that triggered moment for a second. I'm like, okay, Dad. And he says, no, you need to listen to me. This is really, really, really important. I said, okay. No, Paul, listen to me. All right, Dad. I need you to hear me. I am really, really, really proud of you. I'm proud of the man you are. I'm proud of the father you are. I'm proud of the husband you are. I'm proud of the way you've touched the world and I really, really love you. If I had had expectations, my response would have been, well, it's about damn time. <laughs> but I didn't have any. And here's this man I know so much more about in that moment saying to me and giving me a gift. A gift. When you learn to live without expectations, everything becomes a gift. Expectations are just prophesied disappointments. And so inside that, again, the ways and truth, truth of our being, the truth of our being, the truth of our being. Now, when you think you're a piece of shit, you have an excuse, right, to act like one. What do you expect? You know, I was sexually abused. What do you expect? But I know now that's not my identity. It was something that happened to me, and we've got to work it out. But it's not who I am. When you know the truth of your being, you now have to work. This is working out your salvation in part, is beginning to let go of the excuses of acting in certain ways as if they were the truth of your being. Oh, I'm just... I'm just an impatient person. Bullshit. You are a patient person who doesn't want to embrace the reality of the truth of who they are in Christ. I just have no self-control. Not true. Not true. Not true. And yes, there could be experiences, there could be damage that all puts a clamp on that freedom, but it's going to be worked out. And if you make your identity your damage, you will continue to use it as an excuse to keep hammering yourself and dropping you into shame. And it's work. It's incremental. It's slow. It's painful. But never alone. The smallest group you will ever be in is four. <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and you. And where two or three are gathered, there's the Lord. But we also have the community of faith. And part of our learning how to trust is to trust people who are flesh and blood. Important. Wholeness is when the ways of your being match the truth of your being. 
And this is not just self-talk. This is not just, you know, make stuff up. This is the truth. This is why God can say, be holy as I am holy. In other words, look at me. The ways of my being match the truth of my being. And that is why any theology, any scripture that violates the revelation of God in Jesus is either talking about something that is a metaphor, something that is a story, trying to prove something, or, but it's not literally true about God as love. God doesn't kill children. Does, God doesn't actually kill any human beings. We do. And now God has, in union with us, begun to set us free from the law of sin and death, and, the, and God in us begins to express God's very nature and being in the embodiment of who we are. And we become those who love the person who is in front of us, who responds to the situation in kindness, in goodness, because I am good by nature. I am self-controlled and pure of heart. I haven't had an issue with lust for 30 years. I have a friend, when I told him that one time, he bursts into tears. He'd been in the mis been ministry a long time. And he said, I've never heard a man ever say that. That's sad. But sometimes we need an incarnation in order to know that it's even a possibility. I can still get triggered by stupid drivers, you know? <laughs> I can forget and kind of like it. <laughs> so, but a lot less than I used to, let me tell you. You know, I am kind and I am patient by nature. And that now comes in front of my mind when I'm driving. I am patient by nature. I am kind. I am long suffering. I am good. I am love. But my love is not independent. It is absolutely in union with the presence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, apart from whom I can do nothing. Nothing. Nature of God, ways of God, nature of being human, ways of being human. Do you see the connections? And all of a sudden, we can look at ourselves and we can begin to tell ourselves what the truth is and thereby live out of it. Be holy as I am holy. Why would God say that if it wasn't even a possibility? Be whole. Be free. Be kind. Be good. So then you can read the second half of those epistles and you know exactly what's going on. And life becomes this incredible adventure of expressing the truth of God's being inside and in union with the truth of who I am being expressed from the inside out to the praise of his glory. Amen. 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 Okay. All right.